Ferris from Washington Elementary School. Um, I teach E2 Montessori, so I have third, fourth, and fifth graders in my classroom. Um, come and join me as we read this book. We're reading Big Jabe by, by, Jer by Jordan Nolan. We have a great big pear tree in our yard down by the river. Papa Jabe planted it there in slavery time. That tree doesn't give any fruit now, it's too old. But Mama Mary says that sometimes after it's gotten a good rest, little white flowers blossom on it in the spring. That tree has probably forgotten more of the world than most folks remember, Mama Mary says. And on days when the wind blows and whispers that only bees can hear, she tells me a long, long time ago story, like the one about how freedom came to the slaves on the Plenty Plantation. A long, long time ago, when young Addie was a house slave on Simon, Plant Simon Planty's plantation, she had to clean out the big house. But what she loved to clean out was the river. And when she went fishing, she made sure that everyone got lots of fish to eat, and not just the heads or tails either. Now, Mr. Plenty loved his catfish, bass, and brim. He loved them baked or poached or cooked all together in a spicy bayo fish stew. But he especially loved them fried, just the way Addie's cousin, Sweetie Belle fried them. One day early in the spring, Mr. Plenty awoke with a powerful hunger for fish, so he sent Addie down to the river to fetch them. By midday, Addie was mighty vexed. She hadn't gotten a single nibble on her line. If her luck didn't change soon, she'd be facing a Mr. Plenty who was both angry and hungry. She tried not to think about which was worse. Then Addie saw something bobbing in the water. It was a wicker basket, and something was inside it. When the basket got caught in the roots of a fallen tree, Addie ran downstream to catch up to it. A little boy, about five or six years old, just sat there, smiling up at her. She scooped him up and set him on the ground. In the bottom of the basket where he had been sitting was a plump, round pear, as golden as a noonday sun. Here, said the boy, for you, for fishing me out of the river. Addie took a bite inside. This must be a fruit of heaven, she said. Why they call it, what do they call you? Jabe, he told her. When Addie had finished the pear, Jabe dug a deep hole with a stick, dropped the seeds into it, and covered them over. Then he brought water from the river to soak them. They want to grow, he told her. Well, Addie thought, it is spring after all. Jabe looked at Addie's fishing pole. Then he looked at her empty wagon. You fishing? Supposed to be, but I ain't catch nary a one. Jabe leaned over the river, cupped his hands around his mouth, and called, Fish, fish, where is you, fish? Jump to the wagon like Miss Addie's wish. Suddenly, the earth began to tremble, the river began to roil, and the air was filled with fish. Jumbling, hopping, flying right into Addie's wagon, Jabe opened his little boy mouth and laughed a big man-sized laugh. Mr. Plenty took no notice of Jabe that day. It was hard to see anything over the piles and piles of fish. Come nightfall, with the chores all done and the big house finally finally settled and quiet, Sweetie Belle and Addie set out to collect the fish that she and Jabe had, had hid for the folks in the quarters. Laying boards atop some barrels, the women folk set a fine table, and there was no hunger around it that night. Jabe sat next to Addie. This is the first little boy fish I ever did catch, she, she said and laughed. And when she told about the wonderful way Jabe had caught all this fish, called him right out of the water he did, folks ooed and awed, and Jabe sat up tall in his seat. That spring was the growingest spring anyone on the Plenty Plantation ever remembered. Cotton plumped up so quickly it seemed to blossom overnight. Corn stalks looked to scrape the sky, yielding foot-long ears of sweet, sweet corn. Chicks hatched by the dozen. New fowls were ready to saddle break at six months. Jabe was growing too. By May, he had left his boyhood behind and showed no signs of stopping. By June, he was a full-grown man and had the strength of 50. He could weed a whole field of soybeans before sunup, hoe the back 40 by midday, and mend 10 miles of fence by sunset. Life in the quarters just didn't feel so burdensome with Jabe around. <clears throat> Suddenly, there was a time for leisure. 
But this enraged Mr. Sorensen, the overseer, just as much as it satisfied the slaves. Addie spent her evenings at the riverbanks, visiting the tree she, had, she and Jabe had planted. From night to night, she could hardly believe her eyes. One day it was a sprout, the next it was a sapling, the day after that it was a young tree full of pretty white blossoms to decorate Addie's hair. In another blink of an eye, that tree looked as if it had been rooted there forever. Its mighty trunk made Addie feel safe. She went to it often and stayed with it late. Its branches arched over her, full of luscious pears, and there, shining between them, the North Star sparkled overhead. Now, by yourself, I want you to think about um, that pear tree. That pear tree makes Addie feel safe. What do you think it is about that tree that makes her feel so safe? So think it. Think about this question to yourself. You can pause the video or you can talk with a family member that you have at home. So why does that pear tree make Addie feel safe? All right, I'm gonna keep on reading. No sooner had the seed leaves appeared, that long row of fluffy white clouds spread over the land. The cotton was ready for harvesting and Jabe was ready for the cotton. One night by the light of the moon, he set out alone for the fields. He moved so fast that field, field looked like a snowstorm in the dead of winter. So much cotton was flying round that come morning when the sun rose up, it couldn't shine through. So the cock didn't crow, not an animal in the barn stirred, and not a single person in the big house or the quarters knew that a new day had dawned. Everyone slept late. By noon, Dave had finished the picking, and the sun finally blazed down on row after row of bags stuffed to overflowing. It was such a plentiful har harvest that no one noticed the sacks Jabe carried off to the quarters, with enough cotton in them to replace every corn husk and every mattress. But as the slaves looked forward, to the first soft sleep of their lives, Mr. Sorensen was boiling over. With Jabe doing all the work, just who was he supposed to oversee anyway, he aimed to break Jabe, but Mr. Plenty wouldn't hear of it. I don't want anything interfering with Jabe's calling, he said. You're not to lay a hand on him, you hear? So Mr. Sorensen stayed away from Jabe, but when he found Pot Tim whistling as he worked in the stables, he whooped him good. It was a good thing for Mr. Plenty that all the cotton was picked, because the very next morning a twister blew in bad. It lifted full-grown trees out of the ground and tossed them around like they were no more than dry leaves. It picked up the chicken coop, chickens and all, and carried it to the middle of the cow pasture. It tore the roof clean off the barn. Not a shingle was left behind. Then that storm stopped, as suddenly as it had started. Mr. Sorensen sent for Pot Tim to mend the barn roof, but he was nowhere to be found. Pot Tim had vanished and his wife Molly and their two children with him. Mr. Sorensen was certain that they had escaped under cover of the storm and he set out with the dogs after them, but the hounds never picked up a scent. Twister starting to carry families off too? Scooty Bell mocked behind the overseer's back. Show nothing strange, Dubell agreed, but, they, but they's in Ohio by now. He chuckled and slapped his knee. Addie listened to them all and pondered their words in their heart. She thought about the day she had found Jabe and how he filled her wagon with fish. She thought about how fast every little thing had been growing. And she thought about the pear tree with the north star shining through the branches. Suddenly, Addie gasped. Jabe took Pot Tim to that pear tree, she whispered, but no one heard. Mr. Sorensen said, said Jubal and Lester to repairing the barn roof, but Jabe came along with them. How his hammer flew. Seemed like Jubal and Lester never even had to hand him a nail. They tried to help, but truth was, Jabe didn't leave them much to do. The roof was raised long before supper time, as tight and secure as a drum. Mr. Sorensen, who watched tight-lipped all afternoon, fumed. So he could find no fault with the roof and he didn't dare find fault with Jabe. He could let loose on Jubal, and he did. The next morning, the heavens opened up. 
rain poured down so hard, seemed it would wash away the topsoil clear down to the core of the earth. When it stopped, looked like some of the slave folk had been washed away too. Now Lester and Sweet Bell were gone, and so was Jubal. Mr. Sorensen ordered the cabins torn apart, searching for them, but no one was found, not even a footprint, not a trace. Show is mighty strange, said Tessie. Was it no wind took them away, Hazel added. Weren't no flood neither, Jim clicked his tongue. I bet they went the way of the river. The water washed their footprints away. Nah, said George. River runs south, and it runs too fast to follow no how. Maybe moose is coming the night, said Maisie. Jabe took them to that pear tree, Addie whispered. This time people listened. But in spite of twisters and floods and missing slaves, the planting plantation was as good as its name that summer. Speckled cows spotted the fields and gave enough milk to fill a river. Sheep produced enough wool and one shearing to knit a blanket big enough to cover the entire farm. The barn was bursting at its seams. Three more smokehouses had to be built to handle all the meat. The, the larder in the big house was crammed so full, Abby could hardly open the door to stuff it in more. Then came the day when Susie, a broken down old plow horse, was to be put down. But when Mr. Sorensen went for her, Susie was gone. Folks thought she had walked off to die on her own, but she turned up that afternoon, grazing beneath the pear tree. Now there was nothing so odd about that. What was odd was that Susie had gotten hold of her youth again. She whined and pranced like a new fowl. Somehow she had changed from a tired old workhorse into a young, Philly ready for a race. It was George who found her and brought her back, and a story spread through the quarters like fire set to dry kindling. But when Mr. Sorensen asked where she had been, George just told him, in the woods. Mr. Sorensen knew there had to be more to it than that, and he was certain beyond a shadow that Jabe had something to do with it. And who had brought Jabe to the plenty plantation in the first place? Addie, that's who. If there was magic afoot, then Addie had to have something to do with it. Neither Mr. Sorensen nor Mr. Plenty wanted anything to do with spells and charms, so Addie was put in chains and locked away in the smokehouse. Come morning, I'm selling that gal away from here, said Mr. Plenty. First thing next morning, Mr. Sorensen went for her. But when he undid the lock and opened the door, the chains were lying empty on the floor. Addie had disappeared. Mr. Sorensen was, was fit to be tied. He searched the barn. He searched the quarters. He searched the big house. He searched the entire plantation. Then he set out with the dogs. But it was all to no avail. Like the others, she had vanished without a trace. Some said she was magic and had flown out through the smokehouse chimney. Some said she had tunneled under the floor and made her escape like any mortal. But some looked out at Jabe, chopping wood, and breathed the thought that no one would say aloud. Jabe took Addie to that pear tree. So again, I want you just to think to yourself or talk with somebody at home. Why would no one say aloud what they thought had happened? Why do you think that the author left this mystery unsolved? So think to yourself about that question or talk with a family member. Remember, you can pause this video to think or to talk. I'll give you a minute. All right, I'm gonna keep on reading. After a while, Mama Mary tells me, Jabe moved on. One day he too disappeared from the Plenty Plantation, though he turned up at different times in different places throughout the South, and everywhere he did, burdens were lifted. Mama Mary tells me all the stories, but the most wonderful, she says, happened right here on our old pear tree. And on days when the wind blows and whispers that only bees can hear, I know that she's right. All right, thank you for reading with me. Have a great rest of your day. Bye.